I can remember, and I think it was like right toward the end of college, uh, maybe right after I'd gotten out of college, and this phrase I heard for the first time, at least maybe the first time it clicked with me, paradigm shift. A paradigm shift. And the thing is, once I heard it that first time, it seems like I heard it everywhere. Everyone is talking about paradigm shift and paradigms, and I got so sick of it, I, you know, I would joke, I'll give you a quarter for your paradigms if you'll just shut up about them. Uh, I'll give you a buck even, I'm serious. Uh, but, you know, there's some value certainly to the, the thought there. A, a paradigm shift is a, a radical change in underlying beliefs. And I, I wish even, that's a definition I found, I even change, you know, a radical transformation, alteration, because I, I would... I would contrast a paradigm shift with a simple change. You know, there's, it's one thing to change. It's like I sort of know I should be doing this or whatever. Or when I hear it, I'm all for it, and, and I change. I need to change. Paradigm shift is deeper. It's more fundamental. You know, it's easy to always compare things to diet and, you know, and food. And, you know, change is like I know I should eat less junk food, and, uh, you know, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. You know, I need to change. You know, paradigm shift is what, you know, and it's still being debated, but this idea, you know, I, we've talked to some of you about it, you know, we read about it, that, you know, this thought for a long time has been, you know, fat's the big culprit, and this paradigm shift, I'm like, no, it's really carbs, even the high cholesterol is caused by, you know, it's not just the fat, it's when fat in the presence of some of these carbs, and, and you talk to people, and there's just radical, you know, differences of opinion on that, that's a paradigm shift, that's just changing everything. Well, that's the difference, and that's what I want us to, to focus on today. Not just changing, not just, hey, I've known I should do this for a while, I, I need to do it. We well, need to be thinking about a paradigm shift, a, a radical alteration of underlying beliefs. Now, here's one of the problems, though, as you think about that. Until you have a paradigm shift, you don't know you need a paradigm shift. <laughs> that's one of the things. Now, again, until you make a change, you may have known for a long time I need to make that change. But a paradigm shift, until something becomes awake in you and you start to realize it, you didn't know you needed it. Well, that's what we've been seeing in Matthew. This, group, this chapter is really, starting in 14, uh, you know, it led up to it. You know, in 14, you remember, we saw John the Baptist, and he's executed. And he had this paradigm shift, uh, and uh, it really came home to him. You know, because he thought, well, certainly if Jesus is the Messiah, and I'm the main guy, the forerunner, life is going to be a certain way. <laughs> and it was totally different. You know, and then the disciples, you know, they had that limitation. You know, Jesus has done all these miracles, but here we are with 5,000 men, you know, probably 15,000 people all together and just a little food. There's just no way he can use that to feed them. And, you know, they had to have a radical change of, yeah, he can do that too. Well, then last week, uh, Mark, or Matthew 15, and I'd say really part one, uh, 15 is part one, chapter 16 is part two. But remember, it started with the Pharisees, and, and they asked Jesus, why don't your disciples wash their hands? You know, he'd been doing all these miracles healing people, and you, they don't wash their hands. You know, but it had to do with their idea of what defiled a person. You know, not washing your hands in their mind, you know, that would make a person unclean before God, even though they admitted it comes from our tradition, doesn't come from the Bible. Jesus showed how, like, you put your tradition over the Bible. That's just totally wrong, a totally wrong way of viewing things. And as usual, they're, the, they're that extreme example that we look at and say, well, of course. But then we see it even in some other ways, that the next scene in that chapter is this Canaanite woman. And you ask any Jew, who's more defiled than a, a Gentile, a Canaanite, non-Jew person, and a woman to boot? It's just the most defiled ever. But according to Jesus' definition of what defiles a person, it's not what goes in their mouth and some of those habits, it's what comes out. And her faith that came out of her mouth from her heart was so great. It was just this contrast set up. You know, here's the keepers of the Jewish law. They're actually defiled. And this Canaanite woman, she's as pleasing to God as you can get. And then the disciples, and you were faced with another food situation. Like, well, didn't they just feed 5,000? Now here's 4,000. What's the big deal? But the focus there is a little different. doesn't seem like they're unsure that Jesus can do it. I'm like, this is a bunch of Gentiles, Jesus, and it's going to take us a long time to pass out this food. You, you really sure? Come on. Seems to be the underlying thought there, again, because they didn't have the compassion on those people that Jesus did. They were unclean in their mind. It, it was a radical change to be ministering to Gentiles, and, and it wasn't Jesus' focus while he was here on earth. He makes that clear. But when he saw them, when the need was right in front of them, he helped them. 
Again, that was really part one. Well, part two is in Matthew 16 today, what I'm calling the deconstruction zone. Because, uh, again, I, I read this book a, a while ago, and it stuck with me. that The path, the, the mode of growth is this idea of examining where we are in light of often new truth, something we see in the Word, something comes to us, uh, examining our life in light of that, and potentially deconstructing what we know, what we thought we knew. And again, maybe adding this in, maybe totally getting rid of something, changing something, deconstructing, and reconstructing. So we're in a deconstruction zone here in Matthew 16. And the question I want us to think of in you know, the, the, the framework for everything today is how open am I to challenging what I know? How open am I to challenging what I know and maybe have known for a long time? So Matthew 16, starting at verse 1, the Pharisees and Sadducees, these two groups of Jewish leaders who normally hate each other, uh, absolutely, but now they hate Jesus more, so they get together. (laughs) And they came to Jesus and they tested him, sort of like Satan did, trying to trip him up a little, find something, they certainly aren't sincere, by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Now, Jesus has been doing miracle after miracle, and the Gospel of John calls those signs. They are signs. They indicate who Jesus is, his position with God. He's come from God. Well, they seem to be wanting, you know, let us just tell you right here, and you do exactly what we say. And and again, it wasn't because they were open to believing in him. And then Jesus replies, verse 2, When evening comes, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, But you cannot interpret the signs of the times. (laughs) A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. You know, in the Old Testament, Israel was called adulterous because they they were engaged in idolatry. They were married to God, should have been committed to him, and they were going after these other gods. Well, they haven't worshipped idols for 400 years. But they're still not committed to God the way they should be. They're still adulterous. Their commitment is somewhere else. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he had explained that the last time, this idea of being in the tomb three days, like Jonah was in the the fish three days. Jesus then left them and went away. And I made mention, you remember just a few chapters ago, Matthew 12, there'd been something similar where the leaders came to Jesus and asked for a sign. And when you ever see something like that repeated, you, you need to ask why. What's the difference? If it's not making any new point, there's really no reason for a good author to put that in. And Matthew is a good author, and he's inspired by the greatest author, so there's a reason for this. Why does it include another time when the Jews ask for a sign? Well, you look for the differences. And you see the differences here. In chapter 12, the focus was on judgment. You remember, there was a a big section where he said, none will be given, no sign except the sign of Jonah. And Jonah went to preach after, you know, God, you know, convinced him. (laughs) You really need to go to Nineveh, Jonah. (laughs) He said, I don't want to. Well, I'm going to change your mind. You know, the whole fish thing. He goes to Nineveh and he preaches them. And what happens? Nineveh repents. They turn to God. Well, Jesus makes a point from that. It's like, you know, the men of Nineveh are going to stand up in judgment against you Jews because Jonah preached to them and they turned and I'm here preaching to you. And as a nation, as a whole, you're not turning. So the focus there was on judgment. Well, the focus here in chapter 14 is uh, on these verses 2 and 3 that aren't present in chapter 12. Where Jesus says to them, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. He says to them, you know, you look at the weather, you see these things, you know how to interpret these natural signs. You know what the weather's going to be based on the clouds, the sky, things like that. But you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Now, notice when he says cannot, it doesn't mean they're unable to. Jesus is being a little sarcastic here, I guess you'd say, because... One, we know other people could. It's not like they're unable to. These are the religious leaders. If anyone's going to grasp the truth, they're capable of it intellectually. It's not that they cannot so much. It's that they they won't. You know, Jesus said before, whoever has ears, let him hear. And remember, everyone has ears. Everyone's eligible. They're refusing. It's right there in front of them. And they're refusing to accept it. Well, then, verse 5, when they went across the lake, because it says Jesus left those leaders and went away across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They, the disciples, discussed this among themselves and said, it's because we didn't bring any bread. That's why he brought this up. (laughs) Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you have little faith. 
Why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five basket or the five loaves for the five thousand and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. <laughs> Jesus says to, to these disciples, again, they've forgotten to bring bread, and it seems, you know, Jesus apparently knew that, the Holy Spirit knew it, and used that situation and says, and puts it in that format when he's warning against the teaching of these Jewish leaders. He says, beware of the yeast of these people, and the disciples like, oh, it's because we forgot to bring bread. And Jesus says, you of little faith. And we've been seeing that word. And again, it can have different meanings. There's the belief side of faith that is just like, I believe there's a God. I believe this is possible. Doesn't seem that they didn't believe Jesus is capable of providing in that. But they hadn't taken it, the, the implications. That's where the faith comes into play. You know, since there is a God, since he's all powerful, it should do this. It should result in not just, I believe, but this, this faithful implication of putting it into my life and integrating everything around that, relying on him, you know, surrendering to him because he's God and I'm not relying on him because he's God and I'm not. And Jesus it corresponds to his question in verse 9, do you still not understand and it's not just, don't you know that 2 plus 2 equals 4? Don't you know what I can do with these lows? Why haven't you taken that and framed your whole life around that? You know, it's very similar to what it means to walk by faith. Again, your whole life should be different. You should be taking what you've seen and, again, applying it, integrating it into your life. And you're not. And you're so focused on the physical. And Jesus' question there, he says, do you still not understand? It indicates they should. You know, if they were totally unable to, it doesn't seem like he would say it that way. Like, well, I understand. You haven't got there yet. No, you should be there by now. You've seen enough. should be in your life. And then in verse 12, they get it. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And I think we need to stop and look at that because, you know, very often I think what we associate with their teaching is the extreme, you know, their hypocrisy of the Pharisees that we saw last chapter. It's like, you know, I've got stuff, but I'm not giving it to my parents because I've declared it for God. You know, the Sadducees who didn't believe in the, the supernatural, the resurrection. Jesus is not warning them against those things necessarily. Those are obvious. Those are clear. He's warning them against some of the underlying things, again, that they would be tempted to not even realize I need to stop and think about those. You know, the, the paradigm shift that needs to happen, they don't realize it yet. And he's warning against primarily their view of the kingdom of the Messiah. The, the leaders, the Jewish leaders, long ago had established this kingdom of the Messiah. It's going to be physical. And all the Jews had bought into it, and the disciples as well had bought into it. He's saying, be careful of that. Be careful of their focus on the physical in general. That is not what I came to do. Beware of their leaven. And you know what? What he's going to be like. And somehow they left that part out. They did and they didn't. It's like, I do, but I don't. And that's why he's warning them, because they are as prone as anyone to this. Matter of fact, we're going to see it right below. And that's why this chapter all goes together. Look at this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, it's a mainly Gentile area in the, in the north, he asked the disciples, Who do the people say the Son of Man is? He's referring to himself, that, that title Son of Man is interesting because sometimes it's contrasted with Son of God. And like, well, Son of God refers to his God side, Son of Man refers to his man side. And sometimes it sort of does, but also it is a title from Daniel that indicates his deity. So there's a little bit of both, but it seems here he's using that sense of just a, the Son of Man, someone that they already accepted, that's why he's using it so openly. Who, who do people say I am, basically? Well, they replied, the disciples. Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. You know, John the Baptist, we saw Herod thought Jesus was John the Baptist, sort of come back to haunt him or something. You know, and we've read the Old Testament says before the Messiah comes, Elijah is going to come back in some sense. And, you know, some people mistook that, you know, it wasn't John the Baptist who was that Elijah figure. They're thinking Jesus is, and there's a Messiah to come. Others thought, well, Jeremiah, why? Well, because Jesus 
does some things that are similar to Jeremiah, and there's some parallels there, or maybe just some other of the prophets. Well, here's the thing. What do all those answers have in common? They're from God, but they're also from what period? Old covenant, Old Testament. Yeah, you're someone from that old covenant, and they're not ready, and that's the thing they knew too. There's going to be a new covenant, but for them, they're focused on that, that old, and it's why Jesus warned uh, uh, earlier in Matthew. Remember when he said, I didn't come to t- put a new patch on an old garment. I don't pour new wine in old wineskins. That, that's not what I'm doing. Well, their mindset was pretty much that. This Jesus, he's, just, he's, a, he's an improvement over some of these Old Testament, but he's just going to continue and improve that old covenant. Uh, and takes him back to there. He's, he's got it. He's come from them, but he's making the point. There's a sharp distinction between what I'm doing and that. And again, they should have known. The Bible promised. Jeremiah promised a new covenant. You know, they, they sort of like the old one. They just, again, they want some tweaks, some improvements. <laughs> Sometimes we're like that. We just want God to tweak our life. Well, verse 15, Jesus says, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, one thing we need to realize is that for them, that was two different things. You know, very often, because we've come to realize Jesus is the Messiah and he's the son of God. And we think, well, they were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for the son of God. Same thing. No, they had no idea that the Messiah was going to be anything other than a normal person. He was going to be a special. Messiah simply means anointed one. And in the old covenant, It could be, and I often say, you know, there were several messiahs with a small m. You know, any king, when he became, he got anointed. A prophet would get anointed. They put oil on his head. You're you're dedicated to God. They they were messiahs with a small m. But there was this expectation, and God had promised, there's going to be a a messiah with a capital M, you might say. A special one. But they didn't know he was going to be God himself in the flesh. And, And so this was something, you're the messiah. You're also the son of God. Now, even then, it's, it's argued. What, what did they know at this point when they said Son of God? Did they know everything? No, because we don't know everything. You know, when it comes to the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know, that's one thing none of us get. We'll never get. So they didn't understand it completely, and chances are they understood it less than we do because they didn't have as much revelation. Now, it does say earlier in chapter 14, you remember when Jesus walked on the water and got in and the, the storm calmed? They worshipped him. And the Jew's not going to worship anyone who's not, again, Something different than a human. So we don't know exactly what they thought, but definitely Jesus is, they're putting him in a unique category. And understand the full trinity, but you are something different, something unique, something, a relation, a connection to God like no one else and no one before. Well, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, Peter's other name, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. That's another one. You read all kinds of different things. What what it seems to be is, you know, it wasn't like someone came up to you and said, hey, here's the Messiah, and you're like, okay, I'm in. He's the Messiah. I agree. No, to to come to this conclusion, it's things you had seen from God, the, the miracles. You know, John makes it clear. That's what the miracles were done for, to reveal Jesus' identity. So, again, it wasn't just, and it's not so much, it wasn't human reasoning, because his human reasoning did kick in. He saw the miracles. Okay, who's doing miracles? Someone that God has sent. And here's what Jesus says. He makes claims about himself. God's not going to grant miracles to someone making false claims. And so there is an element of human reasoning. It's not that flesh and blood is, it wasn't revealed by human reasoning. Again, it's like no one just came up to him and said, Peter, this is the Messiah. And he said, okay, I'm in. No, he had to be convinced from God himself. And then Jesus goes further. He says, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now, all of us in this room are good non-Catholics now. And we know the Catholic view of this, you know, Peter on this rock, I'll build my church. That's where the Pope comes from, right? According to the Catholics. And so all of us good non-Catholics, we get as far away from that as we can. Jesus isn't talking about Peter at all. He's talking about Peter's confession. The truth of this, you're the son of God, that's the rock. As usual, the truth is somewhere in the middle. And I'm seeing this myself. I would have told you, you know, but I look at it, read some things, and it makes total sense. Jesus was talking to Peter. The the usual thing that's brought up is they'll say, well, in the Greek, you know, this word for for rock, you know, for Peter, it's a small rock, and for upon this rock for the church is its foundation. No, not usually in Greek. 
it can mean that some in the, in the poetic sense. What the real difference is, is in the Greek, there's a feminine form for rock on the church, and there's a masculine form for Peter. Well, the reason is you can't apply the feminine to Peter because Peter, he's a man. That's why it was changed. The other key difference is Jesus wasn't speaking Greek to Peter. He was speaking Aramaic. And in the Aramaic, it's the same word. You're, you're our Peter, this rock, Kepha. And upon this Kepha, I'm going to build the church. Jesus was talking to Peter. That doesn't mean Peter's going to become the Pope. <laughs> He's just saying, you are the first one to make this pronouncement. The other disciples, either they're thinking it or they're going to think it. Other Christians are going to think it. You know, and the Bible does definitely distinguish the apostles. It says later in the, in the New Testament, you're the, the apostles and prophets are the foundation of the church. Jesus is the cornerstone. They're the foundation. So he was talking to Peter. You are Peter, a rock. And upon you, Peter, the rock, and others like you, I'm going to build this church. So again, he's not the pope, but it's also not just, oh, it's not talking about Peter at all. It really is. And then he says, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Talk about another passage that is just totally misunderstood. <laughs> How often do you hear that quoted? The gates of hell will not overcome it. Yeah, it's from the King James and even some of the modern ones. The ESV, I think, has hell. It is Hades. There are two different words, two different places. Hades, the abode of the dead. Hell is this place of eternal punishment that no one is in yet. Revelation makes that clear. He's talking about the abode of the dead. The, and usually this verse is said, the powers of hell, all through the history of the church, church is going to be established, and the powers of Satan and hell are going to attack it the entire time, but they will not be able to overcome the church. Is that true? Absolutely true. Is it what this verse says? Absolutely not. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. Because, look, even with Hades' hell distinction out of the way, the gates will not overcome it. You don't have to be a military genius to know that gates are not offensive weapons. You know, armies didn't take their gates and take them into battle against another army and batter them with their gates. <laughs> That's not what gates are for. Gates keep someone out or keep something in. The gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. They either won't keep it out of somewhere or they won't keep it in somewhere. And if you want to know where come back on Easter, because I'm going to talk about this in the passage in Revelation that corresponds to it. So there's a little teaser. Look it up between now and then, too, if you want to see some of the other explanations. But it is not that the powers of hell will not overcome the church. That's true. Not what Jesus is saying here. And then he continues to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, here's this idea that, you know, that it can be taken that Peter's the originator of this authority. No, he's the conveyor of this authority. I will give you the keys. I will tell you, and that you does expand, the other apostles, and even us in a sense. God, here's how someone gets into heaven. You know, believe, repent, be baptized. There's the keys, and Peter's the one on, in the first sermon on, in Acts 2. That's what he told these people. You know, they believed, and they said, what must we do to be saved? He says, repent and be baptized. That's the keys. That's how you get in. He bound that on people and he loosed other things you know you don't have to do all these other things but he got it from God that's where the authority comes from then Jesus ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah like what <laughs> they all believe you're the Messiah why don't you want them to tell because we're going to see they still didn't have it right they knew who he was <laughs> they didn't know what he came to do so if they went out telling people they're going to screw it up big time <laughs> So he says, you guys think you're really far along. You're further along than they are. You don't know how far you got to go. Just keep quiet right now, okay? <laughs> we'll work on it later. Well, you look at that, and again, here's this wonderful, you know, Peter leading the way, who Jesus is, and then look at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, basically the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So he makes it clear. There have been little references maybe, but now he makes it clear. I've got to go to Jerusalem, this place they knew was dangerous. That's why he's up in the north, away from that central influence. The Jewish leader says, I've got to go to Jerusalem, and here's what's going to happen. Well, verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. <laughs> Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> it was confession of Jesus. What did he say? He says, this didn't come from flesh and blood, it came from God. What you're saying now, this is coming from Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. 
Jesus knew there's a part of him that would like to take the course that Peter would like him to take. It would be a lot easier. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Your mind isn't on the spiritual, it's on the physical. Well, to me, that verse 22, I always say in a passage, there's typically a wait a minute moment. You're reading through and like, wait a minute. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. And this is to me is the wait a minute moment. Do you see what just happened? Who do people say I am? Okay, who do you say I am? And Peter raises his hand before anyone else. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Didn't know exactly what that meant. I don't know exactly what it means, but he knew you are someone like no one else who's ever lived. You have a connection to God like no one has ever had. That's who you are. And Jesus says, I've got to go to Jerusalem and die. And Peter says, never, you're wrong. I'm not letting you do that. You see the wait a moment there? You are God, but when you and I disagree, I'm telling you you're wrong. I'm rebuking you sternly. You are absolutely wrong. It was just unthinkable to Peter. It was absolutely inconceivable, <laughs> to use that word in the right way, that the Messiah would die. It just, again, we can't even fathom how different it is. You know, it, it'd be like if you've been reading your kids the story of, you know, Little Red Riding Hood over and over, and it, it all ends up happy that the wolf's dead and, you know, Grandma's okay and Red Riding Hood. And then the next time you, you read it, and, and the wolf ate Grandma and Red Riding Hood, the end. <laughs> They're like, no, it can't be that way. Everything I know says it's not that way. That's what was happening with Peter here. He'd heard ever since he was a child from the religious leader with no question, no doubt. The Messiah is coming and he is going to set up a physical kingdom and overthrow the Romans. This was unthinkable to him. You know, Peter and the disciples, they had a different who answer. Who do people say that I am? They had a different who answer, but they had the same what <laughs> as everyone else. You're that Messiah that is coming to set up a physical kingdom and overthrow Rome. That's why Jesus warned them against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know, he knew they knew the Pharisees' hypocrisy to stay away from that. He didn't have to warn them there. But he's warning them here. The stuff you've heard from these leaders so long. And I thought it was interesting. They could add this new detail to the Messiah. Oh, the Messiah is also the Son of God. Okay. But they couldn't change an old detail. <laughs> they could add something new they hadn't known before, but they couldn't change something that they've always known. Well, Jesus goes on then, verse 24, he said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. We shake our head and we say, yeah, okay. Especially because I've been reading that verse a lot lately. It's one of our key verses here. That's what it means to be a disciple. You know what? For Peter and those disciples, it was absolutely just as unthinkable. <laughs> No way. <laughs> Jesus was a teacher. He was a rabbi. We are his disciples. The disciples of a rabbi share in whatever that rabbi gets. And you know what? They're like, we hit the jackpot. Our rabbi is the Messiah. <laughs> We've been waiting for him. Woo! We're the ones that are his disciples. What are we going to get as the disciples of the Messiah? They're thinking, again, we see it later. They ask for their kingdom positions, remember? Oh, can we have the thrones just to the right and left of you? You know, John and James are their mom, really. Hey, can my sons, you know, I, I know you're going to have a throne, and of course there's going to be these other thrones. Could they get the ones right next to you? That's what they expected. And what's Jesus say? You want to be my disciple, the disciple of the Messiah? Take up your cross. <laughs> Whoa, cross? That's what the Romans killed Jews on. <laughs> no. This was absolutely as unthinkable as the other. When Jesus says, I'm going to die, and he told them, you know what, you need to be prepared to die. Like, no way. He says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? That's just a whole different perspective. And again, we look at that and we've heard it for a while. And, yeah, and we're trying to change and live more appropriately to it. For them, it wasn't a matter of change. This was paradigm shift <laughs> to think that this is what followers of Jesus had in front of them. No way. Followers of the Messiah. Verse 27, then, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and, when, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. And we read that, and what do we focus on? 
He'll reward each person according to what they've done. And we know grace, and we're like, oh, it doesn't sound like great. Jesus, what's up? You've got to realize that's not the focus here. The focus, he's just said, I'm going to die. So what's the, the focus? I'm going to come back, though, in the Father's glory, the very glory of God. I'm, you know, dying is the most inglorious thing that can happen. He hasn't even told them about the cross yet. Like, I'm saving that detail because <laughs> that made it even worse. He says, I'm going to come back in the Father's glory. Don't worry. That's the focus there. Again, we focus on the, this other part. But even then, you need to take that in context according to what they've done. He's not talking about works. He's not saying, well, if you've done more good works than bad works, if you're at 70%. If, no, what you've done with what I've said, have you made a commitment to me? Have you, again, laid down your life? This general commitment, not specific works, you know, levels, amounts, certain ones, not these. Have you done that? I'm going to reward you according to that. But again, the focus for them was, <laughs> I'm going to come back in glory. I'm going to die, but I'm going to come back. And then he says, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What's that mean? You know, the kingdom, there's a group, you know, an interpretation. The kingdom is that millennial kingdom that hasn't happened yet. So does that mean there's some of these disciples walking around somewhere? You know, because he says, some of you are still going to be... What's the kingdom? No, can't be just that. You know, again, whatever your millennial view is, your end times view. But it also isn't just the church. The kingdom is not just the church. The kingdom is focused on God and his authority and his reign that's going to be spread. The church is God's people who've submitted to that reign. So they overlap, but they're not the same. Seems to be what he's saying is not just the start of the church. That, that's true, but it seems to be everything. The resurrection of Jesus, his ascension to heaven, the beginning of the church, uh, the spread of the church with power, even the destruction of Jerusalem would be involved in that. Like some of you are still going to be alive when that happens. And that's what he's talking about. Well, all right, there's the, the chapter. Again, why all this focus on, on examining the, what they believe? on deconstructing things that they've thought about for so long. Why this word in Matthew that keeps coming up, you don't understand. Not just you don't get it intellectually, you haven't integrated it into your life. Well, remember, who was Matthew written to? The Jews. Exactly, the Jews. You, you look, Mark was written to the, the Romans, Luke was written to Gentiles in general, and John was written to everyone as, with, as a theological to convince them he was the Son of God. Matthew's written to Jews, and Jews had hundreds, thousands of years of preconceptions about this kingdom. And so he didn't just have to tell them, here's something that you don't have any idea about at all. That's almost easier. <laughs> Start with a blank slate. Don't know anything until you hear. He's got to erase their slate. <laughs> He's got to overcome these preconceptions. And you know what? As I look about at that, I think this applies to us. Matthew applies to us so much. You know, again, it's this series, this whole series on Matthew is called God's First Words to Christians. God knew this would be the first book of the New Testament. It wasn't even the first one written, but it's the first one we open up. And boy, I think he knew, especially us 21st century American Christians, we need this. Because we've got preconceived ideas about what Christianity is. Maybe we've grown up in the church, maybe we came into it, but when we came into it, we were bombarded with, here's what Christianity is. And it's not exactly what Jesus is focused on, far more focused on the physical. And so I think this applies to us. How open am I to challenging what I know? I think maybe sometimes we're as not open as the disciples were. And so three things that, that I got from this. First of all, the key, first key idea, it's our most basic assumptions that need examined. As we ask that question, how open am I to examining things? We're not talking here. I know it's wrong to lie. I know it's wrong to steal. It's wrong to lust and be greedy and angry. We're not talking about those. We're talking about foundational things. And I thought about, you know, the less obvious something is, the less obvious it is. You might want to write that down. That's profound. <laughs> I, I, I said that, and I thought, man, I should just stop there and just leave it hanging. And I decided, no. Yeah, I know. There, thank you, Kathy. Th that helped. The less obvious something is, the less obvious it is. That's what we're talking about. We're trying to get at those things that, well, of course I know I shouldn't lie and steal. Well, if of course you know you shouldn't do that, that's not what we're talking about today. We're not talking about the of courses, okay? We're talking about the things, oh, I didn't realize that. No way. God, said, God expects, God thinks something different than that. You know, the focus here is paradigm shift. 
not just change. It's, it's not just obedience to what we already know. Peter wasn't arguing with Jesus about something he knew. Peter didn't stand up for idolatry and say, Jesus, you know, I think you really should be in this new kingdom. We should have idols again. There's a benefit. We could have a market. No. Peter's not even trying to argue with Jesus of something he knows. You know, Jesus has been talking about prayer. And Peter's not saying, you know, Jesus, I think I pray enough. You know, this whole, I think I'm doing just, I don't need to pray more. No, it's this foundational assumption. Peter says the Messiah cannot die. <laughs> that, that's just a given, Jesus. Everyone knows that but you. The Messiah cannot die. It, it wasn't even that he considered it and rejected it. You, you, don't, even, you don't even think about that. You no. Know, just a given. You hear it, you reject it out of hand. Well, I thought about us. You know, you and I, we know the Messiah can die, don't we? <laughs> we know he did die. What's the lesson for us? Well, what can we get from all this? What's the general trait that they didn't realize that maybe I'm not realizing? And I think it has to do with this physical focus. You look at their kingdom expectation. What was it? There's going to be a physical kingdom. Jesus is going to set up a throne. David's throne, rule from there. The two traits of the Jewish kingdom is going to be physical. It's going to be national. It's going to be Jew only. And even national, if you think about it, is really physical. Because why, how do you determine who's in it? Well, physically. You're a physical Jew, you're in. No matter about spiritual faith, any of that stuff. So even that is physical. And you look at it, the context even. Why is all this stuff together in a chapter? Well, look at, back at verse 5. It says, When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed among themselves and said, it's because we didn't bring any bread. <laughs> didn't you read that and say, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> what you've seen him do with bread. <laughs> this isn't even a jump like before. The first time, okay, we can get it. He's never multiplied bread. Now you've seen it. You're worried about bread. Well, it's just so easy and so natural to focus on the physical need and problem I do see instead of the spiritual power that I don't see, isn't it? It was easy for them and it's easy for us. I can see the problem here, God. I can't see your power. It's just so easy to focus there. I, I can't see your ability to provide. I've seen it in the past and that helps a little, but right at this moment, I'm struggling. And God's principles, again, you know, you look at God's, God's principles. Like, God, I can see the situation here. I can see that if I lie, I'm going to escape some tough time. If I follow your principle and tell the truth, it's going to get me in trouble here with this and that. If I show integrity, all these things, we can sometimes see how it would be better to disobey God. That's the lesson here, this focus on physical versus spiritual. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We live by faith, not by sight. And it's this assumption, I love it. Paul doesn't take time then to give a treatise on the fact that it's true. He just, it's, it's, it's true. It'd be like me saying, again, we breathe oxygen, not carbon dioxide. I don't have to convince you all of that. Like, of course, we know that. That's what Paul's doing. We live by faith, not by sight. That's our whole dynamic for living. And so as we talk about this foundational assumption that they had and we have, this foundational principle, I think, is the way that we guard against it. I can so easily get focused on physical things. Christians, though, live by faith, not by sight. And I'm still finding out the implications of that, and I'm sure you are too. <laughs> but that is what I said as my goal. What does it mean to live by faith, not by sight? That's how I overcome this, this unseen assumption of mine that creeps in in so many ways. Well, I said it's unseen, and I said before, until you have a paradigm shift... You don't realize you need a paradigm shift. So how do we get one? Well, the, the second thing, Jesus progressively reveals the implications of his truth. Remember where it said in verse 21, from that time on, after they acknowledged him as the Messiah, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and die. Why from that time on? Why didn't he tell them up front? If Jesus had told them up front, I'm the Messiah and I'm going to Jerusalem to die, would they have believed he was the Messiah? Absolutely not. So he shows them signs, the miracles. The Bible made it clear the Messiah is going to do these things. He shows them these signs of the Messiah. Thank you. I'm sorry, now I'm back. And then he tells them this other. He progressively reveals the truth. Well, 
he does that for them, and for them it's both. He, he doesn't even tell them some things. They don't even have this fact, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. For us, I thought about it, it's like we've got the whole Bible right now. Does he progressively reveal truth or just the implications? And that's why it's in the parentheses there. And there's maybe an element where he progressively reveals truth. You know, have you ever read through the Bible or some book that you've read before? And, and again, you just like, wow, I, I didn't catch that, didn't realize that, didn't see that. You know, it's been there, but, you know, somehow... And that's certainly God's Spirit working. You know, it's why in our growth triangle, the Holy Spirit's in the middle. You know, what role does he play? Well, he works in all those areas, you know, in our situations, our relationships, certainly the Word. He brings it to us in a different way or something that it clicks with us now. You know, is that truth or is that implications? I don't know, but definitely there's a strong element of implication. You know, I start my life, it reminded me of Abraham. What God say to Abraham? He said, go and I'll show you where. To Christians, what's, what's God say? He says, commit. And I'll show you what. <laughs> Sign your name on this blank paper. I'll fill it out as we go. And God will reveal to us the implications of that commitment. He'll reveal to us what it means to walk by faith. He'll reveal to us what it means to live by grace and have patience and not anger and all these things. But we've made that commitment. He progressively reveals to us. You know, Jesus progressively re reveals. And then also as I was thinking about this, you know what? He realizes we progressively get it. <laughs> You know, the disciples regarding Jesus' identity, and even here, they're, they're, not, they're going to keep getting it a little more, maybe a little backwards, and a little more, a little more. And certainly when it comes to not just who he is, but his mission, what he came to do, that's going to take a long time. You know, Jesus realizes that, you know, we progressively get it, and I think the word for progressively is slowly. <laughs> we are slow. You, you look at Peter here. Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem to die Peter rebukes him. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And so Peter gets it autumn, instantly, completely, right away then, right? No. Acts 1, what's still being asked after Jesus rises from the dead? What are the, what's the first thing out of the disciples' mouth almost? Now are you going to set up your kingdom? <laughs> you know, they've still got that physical mindset. Acts 2 clears that away. But the Gentile thing, it's not until Acts 10, 10 years later. And you remember when the sheet is lowered to Peter? A sheet from heaven. Eat. And what's Peter say? Well, of course, you're God. I'll do it. Like, never, Lord. <laughs> never. I'm not doing this. You're God. You say this. I know something better. Well, God knows we're slow. Don't use that as an excuse. But also, don't beat yourself up. It does take a while to get it. Well, until you have a paradigm shift, you don't realize you need one. That's why God initiates it. But we have to be open and surrendered, and that's the last key idea. Getting it, understanding, is more than accepting and discerning. It's not just a matter of the mind. Again, when Jesus talked to these Pharisees and says, you can figure out the weather, but you can't get this, he's not saying you're too stupid. His whole point with the weather is you're smart enough to figure out the weather. You could get this too. And definitely Peter, I mean, when Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem to die, was there any doubt in Peter's mind what Jesus was saying? Intellectually, he got it completely. You just told me you're going to Jerusalem to die. I understand it mentally completely, and I reject it. And it's not like, are you speaking metaphorically, Jesus? Uh, no, he knew what he was saying. And he says, no, I refuse to accept that from you. Well, the disciples and the Jews, you know, Peter says, you know, you're the son of the living God, but never Lord. And, and I thought about it. You know, we acknowledge who Jesus is. He's God. Do you really and fully believe in God if you haven't surrendered to him? And to say, I believe in God. I believe Jesus is his son. He died for me. Do you really believe if you haven't surrendered? Because that's what Peter did. He just said, I believe who you are, but I'm not surrendered to what you want to do in my life. Do we really believe? And then what's the root problem? I, again, I think there's always this underlying thing, and I thought about it here with the disciples. What was their unexamined assumption regarding the kingdom? What did they just know? The kingdom is going to be physical. What did the disciples want regarding the kingdom? It was going to be physical. What they wanted was what they assumed. See a coincidence there? The disciples, the Jews, wanted their version of God's kingdom, which is ironic because what's God's kingdom? It's God's authority. God, I want you to be in control the way I want you to be in control. Yeah. God, I'm glad you're in control. Here's what I want you to do. What? 
Now, we're not really glad he's in control. We're sort of glad he has power because then he can do what we want him to do. That's not control. And us, again, how open are we to examining what we know? I think the lesson you get here is not very when what I want is what I know. <laughs> when, when what I, I just know is true is the same as what I'd like to be true, well, I ain't examining that. Things are good. <laughs> And so this focus on the physical for us, why are we so reluctant to stop and examine it? Because quite honestly, I sort of like it. You know, some of that sounds weird. God's going to give me a choice parking space, but if it's true, I wouldn't mind it. You know, shade and up close. You know, in Arizona, the shade's as important as clothes. So God, you know, if that's what you got in store for Christians, I'm good with that. Quite honestly. Not to mention some of those that aren't as hard to believe. To buy into, oh, God, he certainly doesn't want me to go through this for that long. <laughs> no way. No, he might. He might. But, boy, when we, it's what we want. We have trouble examining it. So the key to overcoming it, <laughs> need to ask the classic question, is what I want what I really need? Is what I want that's keeping me from maybe really looking deeply, is it what I really need? And you know that really another way you could ask that question is what I want, what I really want. Yeah, how often have you thought, I want this, and you've gotten it, and I didn't want that. <laughs> didn't, didn't at least satisfy what I was trying to fulfill with that. You know, that's why it says in Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I would hear that explained. It's like, oh, when you delight yourself in the Lord, when you really want him, then he'll give you the desires. He'll give you the things he wants to give you. I thought, well, that's a cop out. You know, ask for what God wants and he'll give it to you. But the point is, when you truly delight yourself in the Lord and realize he is what I want, <laughs> I'll get the desires of my heart that I don't need, I'm not even aware of. There's things God's done in my life. I wouldn't have said, yeah, I want that. Or in fact, I would have said, no, I don't. I'd rather have this. And God showed me, no, I, I, I know better, trust me. You know, what's that? It still comes back to this distorted view, isn't it, of what I, I want. Sin's not just, it causes me to do bad things, it causes me to look at the world badly. You know, the verse in 25, I think that's a 25, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What's that mean? Save their life, lose it? Whoever wants to save their version of life. This is what my life should be. Jesus, could you come in and make it happen? Now I've got people cold, don't I? <laughs> yeah. And other people are saying, no way, you know. Sorry. That was always the worst part of the other church, was trying to adjust the temperature. So those, maybe we get it divided. We'll have a hot side and a cold side. And yeah, save their version of life. That's what it means. It's like whoever wants to save their life, you're going to lose everything. You're going to go after what you think your life should be like, and even if you get it, you're going to realize this isn't what I wanted. But whoever's willing to lose that, to surrender everything, you will get life that goes beyond anything you can imagine. That's what he's saying there. And so we need to ask, do I trust that examining my life, <laughs> deconstructing and changing is better? Am I willing to risk it? God, my life right now, maybe it's pretty comfortable. When our life's a little screwed up, we're like, I'm open to anything, God. <laughs> but if our life's pretty comfortable, it's like, am I willing to risk, God, if I really take the time to examine, potentially deconstruct some assumptions I have and change, am I willing to risk my life will be better? Because, you know, it could be worse. I don't really want worse, God. You know, especially when I define what worse and better is. Ooh. Well, what's it going to look like when we do this? I always like that. When we truly, again, we find these assumptions, we deconstruct them, we reconstruct the truth in our lives, what's it going to look like? And I think, again, verse 25, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. You'll find not just eternal life. You'll find this abundant life. You'll find what people are looking for. You find what we've been looking for, and maybe we've tasted some, some glimpse of it, and like, wow. And maybe we've tried something else that looked better, and we're like, that didn't work out. <laughs> says, You'll find this life when you surrender to me, when you get rid of these foundational assumptions that are keeping you from getting it. And again, why is this so important? Why was Jesus, again, two chapters here, a little bit of la the chapter before that. Why is it so important? Because these disciples, the ones he's talking to directly, 
they're the one that's going to carry on these, this mission. If they were to go out now, Jesus is the Messiah, and he's going to set up a kingdom. It's going to be really great. He's like, you people got to get it because you're the ones taking it and telling other people. It's the same with us. Jesus told us, go into all the world and make disciples. And you know what? If we don't get it, <laughs> we're trying to make disciples. Like, come to Jesus. He'll make your life all rosy. Come to Jesus. He won't let things be too bad. Come to Jesus. He'll make you happy. Some of these assumptions, like, no. He doesn't want us spreading that message. <laughs> we'll screw it up like the disciples would have. They were the foundation, so they had to get it. But, boy, we'll have a pretty bad wing on the house. <laughs> Look what I built. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't what Jesus was planning. Well, I always like to end with some input, start to live it out. And you notice I didn't have what do we need to do, because I, I want us to know. How do I see things that I don't even know I don't see? <laughs> how do we get at some of these assumptions that we don't even, I didn't even realize that that's a, this fundamental realization or application of, you know, again, maybe it's a focus on the physical. To me, that's still the key thing. I've, I've just come to focus on the physical so much, and I don't even see, oh, that's a physical focus. You know, even that assumption of mine, this, how do we see these things that we don't know we don't see? 